My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people are my friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and to teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Look, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find you get what you need. And that bit of sage investing wisdom by the Rolling Stones came true today. Sometimes to get your head around truly emotional markets like this one, you have to fall back on a simple narrative that can at least put things in a context that you can understand. See, we do know that the bulls and the bears go at it every single day on Wall Street. But today the bulls got exactly what they needed to win. Confidence. At least enough confidence to force those betting against this market, as they have endlessly, to throw in the towel. And that's how you end up with the day where the Dow rallies 372 points, the SP jumps 1.76%, and the Nasdaq zooms 2.48%. Wowza! Of course, it's no secret that this market's got mold, it's got rot underneath, and it all started surfacing last week, perhaps the most momentous week since the Christmas Eve massacre for the Bulls in December of 2018. Back then, the market was cascading as so everything that could go wrong went wrong, and the short sellers pressed their bets hard. Initially, they got their way as the Fed tightened too hard, but then they had to cover their shorts as the bulls caught a few breaks, enough to get what they needed and turn things around once the Fed backed off a few days later. More on that historical analogy later. I think it could be a good blueprint here. For now, I want to talk about what it looks like when good things happen after a nightmarish period of bad news. This nightmare's lasted a long time, 14.5 months for the Dow and the S&P, 16 months for the Nasdaq. The average bear market only lasts 13 months. During this period, anything that could go wrong, though, did go wrong. Every time we thought the economy would cool down, for example, allowing inflation to come in and the rapid tightenings to end, we'd get some scalding red-hot number out of nowhere, and interest rates would then soar. Sell, 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 sell. Every time we thought we'd get some big earnings surprise from a gigantic tech company, we were sadly disappointed. <laughs> Whenever we thought we'd see some prudent layoffs or orderly unravelings, <laughs> troubled companies were saved, usually by knaves, fools, Mount Bonks or memes, but their money's as green as anybody else's, or was. And don't even get me started on the travesty of a mockery of a sham that is crypto, where bogus new coins seem to be created by the day. The whole fiasco finally took on new dimensions last week when Fed Chief Jay Powell exasperated that incredible, almost emotional, because it's Jay Powell, exasperated appearance on Capitol Hill, where he basically said, this inflation beast just refuses to be slain. We're going to really have to ramp up rates, with the implication that he's far from finished bringing the pain. A big 50 basis point hike just a week ago seemed natural, definitely coming our way at the next Fed meeting this week, this next week. And we figured that nothing would be wrong. Well, let's just say we figured that if he does a half point, it was simply a way station on the way to 6% for the Fed's fund rate. I'm calling that onerous. Winner, winner. Then totally out of nowhere, less than 20 hours after this testimony, we get the single most deflationary action that could possibly be. The destruction of little-known financial institutions that happen to actually be emblematic of inflationary America. And that entity was Silicon Valley Bank. And that's why I think this moment feels like Jay Powell's great 2018 pivot. When his rhetoric got too hawkish, he finally had to change course, allowing the market to roar. See, Silicon Valley Bank, in some ways, represents everything that Powell's been fighting against. It was a bank for uber-rich venture, capital, venture capitalists, actually not that sympathetic a group, who kept pumping out stock for new companies at this point aren't even really needed. Typically, cloud enterprise software plays that we all had to eat and the market couldn't handle, then borrowing against shares that aren't publicly traded yet, if ever, and so they could spend their money pushing up real estate prices while planting new vine varietals, building 100-foot yachts, and, of course, some seaside mansions to boot. Think about it. 
The whole wretched inflationary edifice of excess simply vaporized over a couple of days' time. It was obliterated by two things. One, hard to understand, durational risk from investing in longer-term, high-quality, largely government-backed bonds that still lost a lot of value as rates soared from where they bought them. And one easy to understand, a classic bank run. <laughs> of the grim news, interest rates plummeted thanks to the wipeout of this germ of the inflationary epidemic. Even though we didn't get it the way we wanted, we got what we needed. Since then, every single negative that had previously been able to crush the bulls has broken against the bears. For months, we've had this heedless destruction of Credit Suisse, a bank that simply seems incapable of making money in good times or bad. Just when it finally looked like the thing was going to die, the Swiss basically invented a public sovereign fund to bail it out. Greatest Swiss invention, I would say, since the cuckoo clock, at least if you believe the third man. Then we learned that First Republic, another bank catering to the super wealthy, looks like it's going under, as it does protest too much. And what happens? A consortium of banks gets together, kind of like the end of It's a Wonderful Life, and puts in more cash than Uncle Billy lost. So First Republic stays open. Another save. Well, this one actually looks a lot more like Potter's Bank than it does the Bailey Brothers building and loan. Stocks down big after hours when we got a bit more detail about the cash infusions, including suspension of the bank's dividend. <laughs> Still, we're not talking about First Republic as another casualty of this bank crisis for now. It looks like another save. Then the biggest pinatas of this market, large cap tech, the big value donors, as they shed literally trillions of dollars in market capitalization, suddenly start catching bids and starting rolling over. Why? Because the bears realize if any of these mega cap companies go all gonzo like Mark Chainsaw Zuckerberg, their stocks will soar. Can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Finally, tonight, FedEx, serial disappointed, reports a monster of a profitable quarter with new CEO Raj Subramanian at the helm. And boy, did he do a great job. So now what happens? Take it from someone who's watched these wars play out for 40 years. The bears don't give up this easy. They know they can destroy a bank with a few reckless tweets faster than the new bank firefighter team can put in deposits. They aren't going to stop here. The bears will still try to make the most of earning shortfalls, too. I wouldn't pass them to try to corner the egg, bread, or mac and cheese markets to make us all feel inflation prone. Doesn't matter, though. Something's changed. The inflationary spiral seems to have been swept away for a moment, along with the deposits in Silicon Valley Bank. Along with its demise has come the annihilation of copper, a powerful gauge of economic activity. So, you know, bottom the oil, proving that the president, who depleted the strategic petroleum reserve at much higher prices, could be as great an investor as the legendary short seller Jay Gould, that American rascal. Biden always liked to brag about being the poorest man in the Senate, but maybe he missed his calling as a money manager because he accidentally pulled off one amazing trade. Most of all, what matters isn't whether Jay Powell gives us a quarter point basis rate hike next week or no rate hike at all. I think we'll be fine either way. What does matter is that eight days ago we thought Powell was going to hit us with 50 basis points because inflation refused to be beaten. Now we know he doesn't need to do anything to beat inflation. Those bank runs will do it for him. For real, the job is done. We just need to watch it play out. Sure, the bulls didn't get it the way they wanted it with a soft landing and a gradual reduction in oil prices, but they got what they needed with a stunning flame out of the first national bank of wretched excess and a few banks more. Bottom line. We got what we need, and now, glorious, we no longer need to worry that Jay Powell's going to have to blow a 50 basis point fuse. Let's go to Trey in Texas. Trey. Jim, I bailed on another penny stock today at a substantial loss. I don't know what it is, but it seems like every one of these companies turns out to be terribly managed. Anyways, as you might imagine, I'm looking for a real thoroughbred to get me back in the winner's lane, and I wanted to see if you think Wendy's is saddled up. Okay, remember, a penny stock doesn't get to be a penny stock because management's good. Wendy's is okay. They still have some inflationary issues, and they haven't taken full advantage of what I think is some of the labor savings that they can have. Um, it's too early for me to recommend Wendy's. Now, you can't always get what you want, but we got what we needed. And now we no longer need to worry that Jay Powell's going to have to blow a 50 basis point fuse. On May Money tonight, Okta has rebounded off its lows. So is it time to circle back to the Kyle Company? I'm learning more from the CEO. Then, if the Fed pivots, who could be a winner of a brand new market? I'm sharing what to watch. And Signet soared 11% today after earnings. So uh, what did Wall Street love about that quarter? I'm digging into the numbers. The company's top brand. So stay with Kramer.
Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.